Thanks for the introduction. I'm sorry, I understand German, but my spoken language is really poor. So I'll turn to English. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to talk a little bit about the microbiota, the bacteria that are living in our gut. And I really much appreciated the first talk by Peter Brabeck uh, de Matt and um, Manfred Müller. Uh, I would say I was at a meeting in India and honestly it's really strange that we are paying so much attention to a number of stupid European American that are overeating that become obese. Instead of looking at the problems with malnutrition, as you said, 35% of, uh, of uh, infants um, dying are due to malnutrition. And this is really a vicious circle because malnutrition in infants is associated with the mal, uh, sort of maldevelopment of the brain, and then we have a vicious circle. And honestly, what we really have to do, and also have it on the slide, we have to con be concerned about how mothers during pregnancy are having the right food, because that has a long-lasting effect on their fetuses and on the infants. Uh, I also very much agree, so I had to sort of comment on, um, on the previous talk, Manfred Müller, that I think I, I appreciate the very critical attitude. And I think one big mistake in, in a lot of these huge epidemiological studies are the approach instead of stratifying individuals into responders and non-responders, we are making an average, meaning we are probably lacking information. And also, I agree, one should be very modest because there's so much we don't understand. So with this, I'll talk uh, briefly about the gut microbiota, which I think is extremely interesting. And I'll give you a few, uh, a few uh, sort of um, topics that we have been working on during um, the last 10 years. So first of all, we know we all have a lot of bacteria. They are inside us, they are outside us. And in particular, we have been working on the bacteria that are living in our gut. And there are a number of very nice things about these bacteria because they help us, they digest food, they degrade toxins, and last but not least, they train our immune system. And this is extremely important. On the other hand, there is a flip side of the coin, and that is today we know that gut bacteria clearly are associated with a lot of different diseases. Now I know association is not cause, but still there are some interesting uh, effects here. So, actually, pick your favorite disease, and you will see already now we have a lot of links between gut bacteria and diseases. One of the things I think is fascinating now is the gut-brain axis, and I'll just show one example of that. Actually, there's a lot of evidence now that gut bacteria somehow may influence our behavior. And secondly, also relating to uh, Peter Brabeck's talk, we really need to understand how gut bacteria are established after birth. Actually, we are not sterile when we are born. And also, a lot of people have been thinking about the bacteria in the vagina of the mother. Honestly, they don't play a big role. I don't have time to talk about that. What really matters is the gut bacteria of the mother. These are the ones that normally colonize the babies. Okay, so, so uh, one of the things I would like just to sort of allude to is sort of the gut-brain axis. So we have just submitted a paper actually where we analyzed the gut bacteria in schizophrenic uh, Chinese and healthy Chinese individuals. And as you can see here, oh, that was wrong. As you can see here, we see clear differences in the predominant gut bacteria in the healthy individual compared to the um, Mm. compared to the um, uh, deceased ones. Of course, this is, again, association. We can actually use these gut bacteria to make predictions as to whether or not a person are suffering from, from uh, schizophrenia. But the interesting part is that if we take feces from schizophrenic patients or from healthy individuals and put them back into a mouse, now the mice start to behave like schizophrenic mice. And I think this is amazing. We have even been able to show that we can take one specific bacteria, put back into a mouse, and now this mouse starts to not recapitulate all the features of schizophrenic behavior, but at last uh, some of them. And as you can see here, I mean, it doesn't make... I'm really not happy with this one. 
Uh, as you can see here, the, the, uh, the pattern of movement, you can clearly distinguish the, health, the, the mice that received the healthy control, gut microbiota, and those that received the schizophrenia. So there are clear differences. We also know that these gut bacteria, they can produce a lot of uh, neurotransmitters like 5-hydroxytryptophan, um, serotonin, and so on. So there might be, and we know there are links directly from the gut to the brain. There are even neural connections. So <clears throat> this is one thing I think is fascinating, that maybe a not just a sort of ketogenic diet might work, but we might also try to modulate the gut microbiota and thereby maybe at least ameliorate certain mental disorders. But again, we have to be very cautious. So um, in my institute in China, we've been sequencing and sequencing and sequencing, and one of the ideas, we really wanted to have catalogs of all the genes that are present in the bacteria that are living in our gut. And um, I'm not happy with this one. It's contrary to my own. So as you can see here, we published the first paper in 2010. It was in Nature, but I think it was a good paper, though. Uh, and, <laughs> and then we could, um, we could sort of increase that number. So today, we have about 12 million different genes. It doesn't mean that each of you have 12 million genes, it just means the repertoire in, in, um, in, 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 uh, in the human gut is that large. It's maybe even larger. Uh, since we use mice and pigs, we also need to make catalogs of the gut bacteria and the genes in these two creatures. We have a lot of other sort of animal sequence today. Why do we, why do we need these catalogs? And one reason is that there even though functionally the bacteria you find in a pig and a human are very similar, they actually differ in this precise sequence. So the genes are different. So in order to understand what goes on in a pig and in a human being, you need to have the actual genes, the sequences. Having these, um, this piece of information, we can also make much better prediction as to what these genes can do. And these catalogs are also important because we are actually we, we want to know what proteins are there, what messenger RNA is there, and therefore we need this catalog. And finally, we can use all this information to actually make analysis of what we call metagenomic species. And this is a bioinformatics uh, sort of exercise whereby, even though we don't know the bacteria, based on all the data we have, we can actually predict the presence of new bacteria in the gut. And this is a lot of um, bioinformatics exercise. But in short, what it does is that we say, OK, if we have 100 individuals, and in each of these individuals, we always find that some bacterial genes are present in the same relative abundance, then it means that they are probably linked. So by doing this analysis, we simply link all the genes that always are present in the same relative abundance. And that actually makes us to get catalogs of new, probably bacterial species that have not been isolated so far, but now we can predict what they can do and how they will behave. So this we have had a lot of um, actually very good um, information um, based on this method. Manfred Miller also alluded to genomics, and honestly, I've, I've probably wasted millions of dollars sequencing Danes, diabetic, obese Danes, and honestly, through, we found very little. So, if you look at the diabetic situation, this is sort of a map of, um, of uh, the many genes that are now known to be associated with type 2 diabetes. They explain about 10% of all diabetic incidences, meaning that it's probably not very valuable. And this was one reason that we uh, actually some time ago decided to see, can we actually use the gut bacteria as a better way to understand what is going on in diabetics? And also, um, it's very clear that we see very different uh, compositions of the gut bacteria in healthy individuals and in diabetics. And again, to make a long story short, since we now know all the genes in these two types of individuals, now we can make predictions as to what is lacking in, in, in individuals that are suffering from type 2 diabetes. And in this case, it's very clear they are lacking um, bacteria that produce uh, short-chain fatty acids.
So that was one thing. And then again, using what we call a metagenome-wide association studies, it's similar to a GVAS, but now it's on bacteria. Now, if you look at the uh, highest risk uh, gene, TCF7L2, uh, it increases the risk. If you have this variant in your genome, it increases your risk by 1.47, which is actually nothing. Now there is an Inuit specific gene that increases the risk about 10 times, but this gene or this variant is only found in Inuits, Inuits in, the northern, in, uh, in Greenland in the northern part of Alaska. So it's not very relevant for us. However, in that old paper, we could actually show that if you are harboring one of these two bacteria, you actually have a relatively uh, significant in risk, increased risk to become diabetic. So I think now we're getting closer, but still these are just associations. So in order to really get into the depths here, you really have to think in a holistic way. And you actually have to consider all these things. You have to consider gestation. You have to consider neonatal conditions because this is where there is what we call a win window of opportunities. This is when you actually are able to, say, modify the uh, microbiota in an infant. You have to understand the host transcriptome, the host metabolome, the host proteome. You have to understand this sort of interaction. Of course, there are interactions between the genome and epigenome, and we know the epigenome, as you also alluded to, alluded to can be sort of modified by, by conditions during gestation, during pregnancy. And we have to understand how the uh, epigenome affect or interact with the immune system, and we, the immune system then affect the gut microbiota and the gut microbiota feedbacks on the immune system. So you have to understand this extremely complex interaction between all these different levels. And then you have to actually understand which bacteria are there, how active are they, what kind of metabolite do they do. And finally, as uh, Manfred Müller also showed the very famous uh, Israeli study, you have to consider that food in actually elicit different responses in individuals. So you cannot just say that a low uh, glycemic index carbohydrate is good or high. It really matters what kind of, of um, say, carbohydrate source you, you take in and the kind of person you are. And to understand this, we really need the big data. And this big data is so big that we cannot, we can use machine learning, we can make uh, uh, deep learning, and we need really artificial intelligence in order to cope, to collapse, sort of co co condense uh, all this information into a model that actually makes sense. So you have to take all this. And you really need all these different omics techniques to understand what is going on. So I'll just give you a few examples of what we have been doing in, in China. And one of them is a study that we published last year uh, where we actually took in very, very obese Chinese, and these are not just overweight, they are extreme, they have body mass indexes between 35 and 40. And being a Han Chinese with that body mass index, you are not just fat, you are extremely fat. Probably coping with people in southern uh, United States. Um, so we took them in and we analyzed them, and then some of them were selected for bariatric surgery, sleeve gastrectomy. So what can we see here? Actually, this is sort of the layout of the study, how we actually have to address this problem. And as you can see, we do analysis of the microbiota. We make then phenotypic associations uh, between the microbiota and the different phenotypes. We had, in this case, 167 different phenotypes, clinical parameters that we measured. Then we make Functional analysis, since we deep sequenced all the bacteria, we could predict what these bacteria could do. And then we measured serum metabolites in individuals, and then we could actually, based on all this information, we can actually build a model and we can start to understand what are the differences in terms of bacteria that separates these very obese Chinese from the healthy lean individuals. And then to move from association to causality, now we took, we isolated one bacteria that we thought was interesting, I'll just show you a little bit of that, put it back into a mouse, and holy grail, this mouse was not protected uh, against diet-induced obesity. And then we actually see what happens now when we took the Chinese and put them on a sleeve gastrectomy. Do we then normalize the gut microbiota? So, 
a lot of data. It has been published so people can look it up. One of the things we noticed was actually very peculiar, a very significant changes in the um, metabolites, amino acid metabolites in the plasma of these obese individuals and the lean. And in particular, we noted that glutamate and some uh, Bryan-Stein amino acids were sort of much more abundant in the obese individuals. Looking at the models and so on, then we could actually see very clearly, well, there might be an explanation here. Because we could see that all these um, uh, bacteria that are able to convert glutamine into glutamate, they were increased in the obese individuals, but they also lacked bacteria that were able to degrade glutamate. So the result was that you had in the obese an increased concentration of glutamate in the blood. And we could actually also look at the, sort of the different bacteria, how much do they contribute to this effect? What is the effect size? And one of them was Bacteroides theta yoto omicron. It seems as if the obese individuals really are lacking this bacteria, which is an important degrader of, um, <clears throat> of the glutamate. And then you can probably figure out how to test it, simply to grow this bacteria, and then to put it back into mice. And when we did that, it's very clear that if you now put a mouse on a high-fat diet, it becomes obese normally. But here you can see this is a phosphate buffer control. Here we uh, sort of gavaste the mice with uh, back, uh, killed uh, bacteria, Bacteroides theta yodomicron, and here we actually gavaste with the live bacteria. And as you can see here, body weight gain is significantly less. And we could also show that actually fat mass was left. And at the same time, we could see, yes, when you gave the mouse this one bacteria, you could actually see that the serum concentration of glutamate and the um, phenylalanine and the Bryan-Stein amino acid decreased. So actually, we could replicate sort of the phenotype of the obese simply by adding one single bacteria that is lacking in obese to a, a mouse, and then this mouse was protected against high-fat diet-induced obesity. And then, of course, we ask what happens now in these uh, very fat Chinese when we subjected them to sleeve gastrectomy. And probably, as you will guess already, here you can see the healthy individuals. You can see the amount of bacteroides, t omicron, is very low in the obese. But then, after sleeve gastrectomy, it normalized. So three months after gast uh, uh, sleeve gastrectomy, you had a normal amount of this uh, bacterium in the gut. And at the same time, you also had the decrease in glutamate. So we think, actually, we now have a pretty good example of how we can move from association to causality. So it's very clear that we can see the obese, they are lacking this bacteria. If you supplement mice with that bacteria, they are protected. So I think we are getting close. It's not perfect, but at least we are closer. So now for the personalized. So, so uh, Manfred Müller already showed the very famous uh, uh, Illinau experiment, so I have it here as well. But I think this is an important issue. So this is this confusion. So um, Professor Müller already alluded to it and talked about it. The point is that individuals respond differently to a load of carbohydrates. For instance, some people can eat banana and they get very high blood glucose. Some people can eat cookies and it doesn't matter. So you have to understand this. And the reason is that you have this distribution. So if you take all individuals, the average blood glucose level is the glycemic index. That's fine. But as you can see here, different individuals, they respond very differently to intake of carbohydrates. So, I mean, the glycemic index is at an average, but it doesn't mean that it tells anything about what you, how you are reacting. Another point that we have been working a lot on is protein. So, these are different protein sources. And um, most people actually, I mean, in Denmark, if people want to lose weight, they are recommended to eat the lean chicken meat. Maybe good for a man, but um, it's not good if you're a mouse. So here we made an experiment. So we actually put mice the same background, exactly the same background diet, the same fat, the same sugar. And the only thing was that we added different protein sources. 
And this was actually high protein sources, the so-called slimming uh, diet that people recommend. And now if you look here, casein is actually pretty, it's, it's a very special protein. All, practically all mouse experiments are done with casein as a protein source. Casein is very, very special. Now see if you put them on soy protein, in Brimum, they get the same amount of calories every day. The digestibility we measure that is the same. But still we see these marked differences. So casein very low, actually as low as a low fat diet. Soy a little bit more, cut beef, pork and chicken actually make these mice extremely fat. I think it's interesting that you're recommended to eat chicken. Um, of course you're not mice, but uh, we're actually doing a little bit of experiments on humans now. And, and maybe even more fantastic is if you look at the fat, look at the fat content. I mean, these, have, these mice have ingested the same number, same amount of calories. But the mice that were eating chicken or cork, they actually gain about 18 grams of fat, meaning that half of the body weight was fat, uh, which is quite amazing. And the flip side of the coin, the lean body mass goes down. So if these mice are eating chicken or pork, they gain a lot of fat and they uh, lose muscle. Um, and this, of course, also relates to changes in the gut microbiota. And this is an issue that very few people have addressed. So what we can see is that if people, in this case, we compared uh, entrecote with salmon. And again, the background diet is exactly the same. The caloric intake is the same. In this case here, we also put a little bit of exercise on top of that. Uh, but anyway, what we can see is very clearly that there are differences. So the gut bacteria changes simply based on what kind of protein diet you're eating. And how does that reflect, for instance, your mentality? We don't know. And still, we can also see that the metabolism actually are changed in these bacteria. So they produce and they digest completely different foodstuff. So there's a lot of things going on, and this is something we really have to understand. Carbohydrates, fibers, that's one thing. But the protein source probably is very important. And honestly, very, very few articles have discussed that so far. So the point is that in order to get useful uh, dietary recommendations, it needs to be personalized. Balance between nutrients, macronutrients is important. But all these different carbs and fats and proteins, they are not equal. They are huge differences. And there are interactions between the gut bacteria and your person. That is personalized. And one size definitely does not fit all. And then, just to finish off with a few slides, uh, because there's been a lot of talk about uh, whether the gut microbiota but it could be a new target for treatment. And probably autoimmune to inflammation, metabolic disorders, mental disorders, behavior, anti-aging. I'll just show a few things here. First of all, working in China, China has a long tradition for, uh, for, uh, for uh, fecal microbiota transplantation. Actually, first described in the fourth century. And in the 16th century, it was this very famous uh, Chinese medical doctor, Li Shishen, who actually produced what he called the yellow soup. And this was given to people who had sort of stomach pains and whatever. Um, and then you have all this. If you go Google on the net, FMT, you find this do-it-yourself kit. It's hilarious and it's dangerous. I mean, come on. People even just, actually in this case, they just, you put your poo or the poo from one person you trust into your chick, uh, kitchen blender. As I normally say, I hope they have two blenders anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and then you sort of there are instructing how you take it in this way or this way. It's completely stupid and you don't know what you're doing. And it's completely hopeless because 99% of the bacteria in the gut are anaerobic. So when you blend them in a blender, come on, you kill them. So don't do it. <laughs> um, but actually, it does work. We all know that it works against uh, Clostridium difficile uh, infection. That is pr pretty good. And then also there was last year some very nice studies showing that actually if you transfer bacteria from a lean person to a, a, a diabetic or obese person, it helps some of the patients, not all. So there needs to be the correct match between the donor and the recipient. And this we know a little bit more about today. And then I have to, to show this. This is a recent paper. It was published last week from, again, Illinois in Israel. And what it tells is that you actually you have even probiotic needs to be personalized because 
if you put a probiotic into a human gut, in some patients it will colonize, and in certain patients it will definitely not colonize. So you actually have to understand what is the background in this patient or in this individual, and would that individual actually benefit from having a precise uh, sort of type of bacteria, lactobacillus or bifidobacterium or something. So it's even more complex. So we really have to understand all these niches. We have to understand what are the conditions that a certain probiotic or prebiotic actually would benefit an individual. And just to finish off, I think this is cute. Actually, we are doing this experiment in mice now. So the idea is that you can actually make um, killifish live longer by fecal transplantation. So. What they took, they took actually um, poo from a young killifish and from a, a, an old killifish, and then they transplanted it into elderly killifish, and holy grail, those that received the transplant from the young killifish, they live longer. Maybe you should collect fecal samples from your young kids. I don't know if it would work, but it uh, could be interesting. It'll take some time to, to sort of see if it actually helps, but it's, it's an idea. So. I'm very excited about gut microbiota, and I very much subscribe to the, all the words we heard about caution. And I think, honestly, uh, there's been too much hype about gut bacteria, too much hype about whatever you can tell. So I think, still, this is what I like. This is what we think we know. And this is what we do not know yet, still. So actually, we really need to understand how these bacteria interact with each other, how they interact with the host, we need to functionally characterize. We had, I have a small group in China that actually now have isolated 30,000 different bacteria from human feces. And now we are trying to characterize to see what can they do and how can they interact. We need to understand this host microbiome interaction, immune system, and so on. And least but not la last but not least, we need to understand causality. So we need to really understand is there causal or is it just a sort of a spurious correlation? Lots of people have been working together with me over the last year. Have some very nice uh, people, only part of them in, in Shenzhen, my own group in Copenhagen, Norway, and then a lot of interaction with Regin Hospital in Shanghai. Um, King's College did a lot in terms of our twin starters, and I have a very nice collaboration with what is called the Center for Basic Metabolic Research, and then very nice work with the Chinese University of Hong Kong, with Dusko Ehrlich and his group in France, and with the Technical University in Denmark. So it's really a multidisciplinary approach, and uh, I can just today just give you sort of a glimpse of what we're doing, but I hope you understand it's really interesting, but we still have a lot to learn. So with these words, thanks for listening.